being a kind of crew that most of us haven't met in person, uh, you know, I, I realized I've never actually asked uh, Hadar, like, do you prefer to go to go by Hadar or Hadar? Because when you're only on Slack, usually it's like something that never comes up. So I actually thought I'd lead with that just to make sure that we're on the same page. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, it's Hadar. Hadar. So emphasis on the first syllable. Okay. Cool. It's it's like it's like huh, dar. Cool. I guess. Yeah. All right. Didn't want I'm, to I'm probably just about as good as pronouncing my own name as everyone else. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we're uh, we're gonna have a little. Uh, I'm gonna be the moderator. I'm Charles, uh, and gonna be moderating a discussion with Hadar and. Uh, first, we'll start out with a little bio. I think everyone knows Renko, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, so we're just going to start with uh, some, some initial context, and then we'll dig into the questions. Uh, when you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And as mentioned, Jen will help source and put them in the Google Doc. I have some questions that I was thinking about going over, but ultimately, um, you all are here, and you're more important than whatever I had in mind. So uh, feel free to drop in. We'll make sure to try to get to as many as we can. So quick bio on, on Hadar, uh, before, uh, currently he's at Facebook on the Civic Integrity team. And before that, uh, Hadar has spent uh, uh, the past decade leading product teams across Lyft, Postmates, Kiva, and uh, some other startups, including uh, Quixi, which we're gonna talk about to start. Um, and Hadar enjoys helping founders and PMs think through product strategy, growth, marketplace, regulatory compliance, and technical platforms. I know him as someone who is uh, a prolific writer, but but not necessarily blogs. But you know, uh, I'll, I'll drop his website in here. But I, I'd encourage everyone to take a look because um, it's one of the most interesting websites I've ever come across. You know, it, it's almost like a entire mapping of his thoughts across career, life, and and anything you can imagine. And I think you know, giving a read of that will just show you uh, part of the reason I've always been so impressed by Hadar and and why I've. Uh, you know, valued his thoughts on on basically everything, and and thought he's been one of the most uh, welcome additions to Renko since I've been here. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, I think th there's a lot we can talk about, uh, and I know lots of folks love asking uh, about product questions. I, I have some of those, but I actually think, um, and and you know, Hadar, I'll, I'll let you kind of use the 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 line, uh, check out my website because uh, you know. It's common for, for book, uh, book writers on their book tour to say, well, if you read my book, you can see. So, you know, I actually would rather not focus too much on um, kind of the nuts and bolts of, of all the litany of product questions and maybe dig a little deeper onto some other parts of your career. So um, some background quickly on me. I'm Charles. I've been in Renko uh, for almost a year. I work in operations at MindStrong, a tail health company, and before that worked at Uber and worked in finance. Um, so, uh, I think the first question we're going to start out with was, um, you jumped right into tech, uh, and you joined a company called Quixie. And, and honestly, I didn't really know much about it. I had to Google it, but reading about it, you know, it was a company that went from zero to almost a billion dollar valuation and then back to zero. And that was your first experience in tech. So I'd love to understand, um, just, you know, how that happened, what, what, what that experience was like and also how that shaped your career going forward um, for that to be your first experience. Cool. Um, before, before I answer, I just want to react to the intro. Um, that's super kind of you. I'm, I'm really flattered and I feel like only half of it is deserved at most, but uh, time to be here in the chat. Um, I'll also plug uh, James who's on this call who uh, inspired me to make my own website. Um, so you should check out his too. Uh, um, and he's joining Renko soon. Um, but okay, to, to the question of, uh, of Quixi. So, um, I guess I'll start with just like a story of how I ended up there. And then if there's like other follow-up questions, I'm happy to address. Um, but I actually, um, despite growing up in the Bay Area um, for most of my childhood, um, didn't really think much about tech and wasn't planning on going into it, at least when I started college. Um, I was inspired by like older friends in high school while I was there uh, to work more towards a path of uh, like social work, public service, like politics. I was still unclear when I was, you know, like 18 or 19 years old. Um, but those are the types of things that I was looking more into um, rather than tech. Um, I ended up taking a year off, though, in between my uh, junior and uh, or my, my sophomore and junior year in college uh, with initially not really much of a plan. I just felt like I wanted to take a break and kind of reevaluate what I wanted to do. 
And uh, one of my uh, best friends from high school uh, was working at Quixie at this startup. Um, he was uh, like the intern, like chief of staff. Uh, we were all kids, so can barely call chief of staff uh, to the CEO and uh, recommended that I check out the company as well. Um, and I talked with uh, the CEO, with a few other folks on the team and ended up joining really, again, having zero clue what tech was or like what, you know, what I was going to be doing, but it seemed like it'd be a fun uh, way to spend a year before, uh, before going back to college. Uh, and that's how I started at Quixie. It's kind of serendipitous and yeah, it's like, like super random. Um, and when I joined there, my role at first was to support the CEO in like whatever random stuff he was doing uh, and figure out along the way where I was the most helpful and start to double down there. Uh, I joined right around raising our Series A. I forget if it was like before or after raising it. Um, and I'll explain real quick season in a second. But uh, basically, I joined right around that time uh, and helped out with a fundraising round. Uh, and then once I was done, started to get more into like execution. And that ended up turning into a product management role uh, within a few months that I ended up continuing to do basically for my uh, whole career. Um, so I guess to answer what Quixi is first. So uh, Quixi uh, is definitely the type of company that you would need to Google to understand. Uh, we haven't been around for many, many years. Uh, and I'll be honest, uh, this is like only half a joke. Um, it's even hard for someone who worked at Quixi to explain exactly what Quixi did. Um, but basically, Quixi was a startup uh, that started around 20 or yeah, around 2010, um, right around when uh, like the mobile boom was really starting to pick up. Uh, there were a ton of apps, uh, third party developed on uh, iOS and Android. Uh, it was very hard to like figure out like uh, which apps were the best for whatever use case uh, you wanted to, to do. Uh, and the app stores were not doing a good job of uh, helping users at that point in time to figure those things out. Um, not only that, but if you look at how the internet, uh, like desktop web works, uh, we've t been taking it for granted for decades now uh, that you can send somebody like a specific link to uh, like yelp.com slash specific restaurant in San Francisco or amazon.com slash specific table or whatever. Uh, but at that point in time, uh, you couldn't do that at all with apps. You could only take someone to like the, the homepage. Um, so we were uh, frankly too early. Um, this is maybe a lesson that we can get into more later, but we, we were too early in uh, addressing or in uh, discovering that problem and trying to build a uh, search engine that works on helping you to find an app that is perfect for what you're trying to do. Um, but even further, take you into the specific part of the app uh, that does what you want to do. Um, the like pie in the sky dream was to take on Google and, you know, be better than them at app search uh, while they stick to desktop search. Um, and the like more realistic kind of middle ground to land on was being an enterprise search company, um, similar to like Algolia, like other companies um, helping the uh, big companies in the world that don't like Google for like monopolistic reasons uh, to give them another option for their search. Um, so I, I joined that, that company with that vision uh, at 10 employees and uh, worked there for that year before, uh, going back to school, went back after uh, graduating for another couple of years, um, saw the company go from 10 to like several hundred, like 300 or so employees, uh, raised like $130 million at yeah, like a near billion valuation, um, largely on like salesmanship and like this uh, convincing vision of how Quixie could be this like giant Google-esque company, uh, but ultimately failed. Um, again, happy to get deeper, but like the, the really quick answer for why we failed was uh, we, first of all, like bit off more than we can chew and were too ambitious without like a achievable, like uh, defensible, like intermediate milestone that the company could rest on, even if a longer term thing didn't work. Uh, and also from a more technical perspective, uh, to be able to pull off uh, the like app search and deep linking technology that we were building, uh, we needed a lot of uh, buy-in ultimately from the developer community. Uh, we only kind of realized that as we were continuing to execute towards it. And uh, it's kind of hard to be a small startup convincing a bunch of developers to follow a specific uh, paradigm for uh, how to like architect your apps. Uh, it's much easier for Google and Facebook and Apple to be like, hey, here's a standard. You have to follow this or else you can't be on our stores um, or you at least have a better, uh, worse experience on our stores. Um, so that was kind of the, the beginning of the end for the company. So one, one thing I've noticed uh, in terms of your career, and I, I am curious how deliberate this was, was you've kind of gone from smaller companies to progressively larger companies, right? So you started at Quixi, um, then you were at Kiva, then Postmates, then Lyft, and now Facebook, uh, one of the largest you know, tech companies. And I, I don't know, you know, maybe that's more common than, than we think, but I do think at least within Renko, it's an interesting story in the sense that I find most people are trying to go in the opposite direction. And so I'm curious to, to, to see whether that was deliberate, whether there's some insight that developed that 
led you to this path um, or whether it's just kind of something that happened and uh, it's just happenstance. Uh, do, do you mind digging into kind of how, how that career trajectory happened? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's in part serendipitous and in part intentional. Um, when I first joined Quixie, uh, the space that I was in as an individual uh, was that I wanted to uh, experience building stuff from the ground up. Uh, and at that point in time, my goal was to be a startup founder. Uh, I joined Quixie like before realizing what I wanted to do after college. And I liked the team and the vision and was bought in enough from the early stage where I wanted to start by doing that. But my plan after Quixie was to do my own startup. Uh, so at that point in time, I probably would have never wanted to join a larger company, um, even at like the size of uh, Postmates or Lyft, uh, honestly. Uh, while I was there, towards the end of my time, uh, and this might be biased towards the fact that Quixie did not work out, uh, but I realized that there was a lot that I would rather learn from the industry before starting to like kind of pave my own path, uh, which led me to want to go to uh, at least uh, marginally larger companies than the startup that was Quixie. Uh, and that's why I ended up going to like Postmates and, and Lyft. Uh, in hindsight, I think if I could do it again, I would have probably started bigger. Uh, that's not to say that like there's one correct answer. I think just for like a path that I've taken uh, in my career and what I think would have been better for my uh, learning and growth. That, that, that would have probably been a better path. Um, but yeah, I think it really comes down to like what your preferences are in, in the moment when you're making a, you know, the, a decision as to what the next step of your career should be. Um, and then I'd say the reason why it's gotten progressively bigger is probably, I think that one's probably more happenstance. Like I could have just as easily joined Lyft than Postmates uh, or Facebook than Lyft. Um, I think across all those companies, the consistent things were wanting to be a part of an established company with some uh, approach to doing things that I could learn from and kind of work with like really uh, strong people that have a lot of experience uh, and working on a mission that I care a lot about. Uh, where for Kiva, that was before jumping into any of those larger companies. And it was more of an exploration of uh, like what the nonprofit world looks like, um, how hard I want to uh, index towards uh, like social impact at the expense of like other things like sustainability of a business model or those sorts of things. Um, and we can talk a lot more about this if the group's interested, but um, I came out of my time at Kiva um, not being too optimistic about uh, like nonprofit as a sector. Um, I think there's space for it, but I think that a lot of nonprofits would be better off as uh, for-profit, uh, like social impact minded uh, companies. Um, so I left that kind of exploring that type of stuff um, and went into uh, Postmates and Lyft with a goal of uh, continuing to further the like economic uh, opportunity, uh, like abstract problem that I was trying to help out with at Kiva. Um, by essentially like through the uh, job creation, uh, albeit contractor uh, job creation that Postmates and Lyft do, uh, trying to beat uh, like McDonald's and uh, Starbucks and Macy's uh, with a better job in terms of uh, flexibility and pay. Um, so that, that's kind of what led me to pick Postmates and Lyft. Uh, and then uh, now with Facebook, um, I'll try to keep it for now, but we can take it to any one of these things. But um, at Facebook, um, the, I'm definitely intrigued by working at a big company and it's been a cool learning experience, but um, I don't really uh, think that like working at big companies is going to be like the rest of my career. Like I'm probably not going to spend like, you know, the next 10, 20 years at this size of company. I think that uh, for a couple of years, there's a ton that I could learn uh, in ways that these companies operate that's different than the other sizes that I've been a part of. Um, and I'd say the, the other big reason is uh, in particular, I'm motivated by the uh, impact that Facebook can have on public discourse and uh, on just like how our societies uh, organize ourselves politically, um, which is what led me to the integrity part of Facebook. Um, I, I don't know that I'd be necessarily as excited working on other parts of the company. So, so maybe that's a good segue to dig into your current role, because I think, um, I don't know how much you plan for it. Uh, I guess we all knew the election was coming, but uh, this is probably the most um, important time ever to, uh, if you wanted to work in content moderation of any kind, I couldn't imagine a uh, more interesting and important time. And so, um, I, I know, I know you, you uh, we need campers. Huh? I think, we I need think, campers. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, oh, I think your mic's, uh, your mic's on. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, Apologies. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, I know there's lots of different parts of, uh, you know, civic integrity, po content moderation within Facebook. You're not the one deciding if Donald Trump's tweets or, or posts are the ones that are censored, but you clearly have, you know, an inside look into how things work. And 
I'd be curious to know, because we've, we've had a bunch of back and forth on this. You have a pretty, you know, de clearly defined philosophy, I'd say right now on, on content moderation, but I'd love to even dig deeper on, you know, having worked on the other side, what, what do you now know, uh, or have you changed your mind about content moderation? Um, you know, what kind of insights have you gleaned from being on the inside about this type of work and has it changed your mind or has it not? Um, just love to dig in there. Yeah, totally. Um, I don't know if my mind changed as a result of working at Facebook, but I definitely had uh, a pretty strong opinion in one direction that ended up being uh, changed uh, into what is more or less Facebook's approach. Um, and my, my change of mind happened before joining Facebook. Um, so uh, if anything, uh, my reason for choosing to work on, at Facebook on this problem versus like other companies with different approaches um, was because I felt aligned with, uh, with their approach. Um, and we, we can get into like the specifics of that. But the, the other thing that I'll add in, in terms of what I've learned from like my six months so far on this team is, uh, I mean, this is not like a, you know, it's not, it's not that I didn't expect this, but uh, solving these sorts of problems is like really, really hard, uh, really complicated. And there's no easy answer, even in cases where to a lot of people, there might seem to be a really clear answer. Um, in particular, uh, the team that I work on is uh, inauthentic behavior. Uh, and uh, to zoom out before explaining what that means, uh, Facebook has this set of uh, community standards, which you can think of as like the bill of rights for uh, our platform. Uh, and there's different things that uh, we uh, disallow, uh, ranging from like hate speech, uh, nudity, violence, uh, some like legally mandated things like child porn, uh, of course. Uh, the one that uh, my team works on is uh, inauthentic behavior, like one of these different pillars, uh, which is less about like the thing that you're saying, but more about like how you're saying it or like how it's being spread. Um, so for example, um, if you uh, are claiming to be an American uh, with some opinion, it doesn't matter what the opinion is, um, but you're really from Estonia, um, that, that's something that we want to prevent. Um, or if you uh, run a media publication uh, that's posting stuff on Facebook and you have um, several other pages uh, that you administrate um, that are not uh, overtly communicated to be related to your publication, and you're using them to just like continue to astroturf, like share the same stuff as if there's like several different uh, people with the same opinion, uh, and that results in increasing the perception of popularity of that content. Uh, we prevent that, for example. Um, so that this area is in particular hard to solve because defining what is harmful in the context of inauthentic behavior is just like super vague and abstract. Uh, but even if you're working on like hate speech, um, like who gets to decide uh, and how do you decide if uh, something that someone says is uh, a like benign opinion that maybe is unsavory for some people uh, versus something that is like going to lead to imminent violence or uh, you know perpetuate some state of the world that like uh, that the platform takes a, a strong stance against. I know I'm, I, I saw um, <laughs> Ryan saying he interned at a lobbying firm where uh, their specialty was astroturfing. So. Uh, Nice. Maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe you're putting people out of jobs with your moderation. So Been on the other side of that fight. <laughs> um, so, so let's, let's dig in a little there. Cause I think it's, it's, you know, there, there's so much we can talk about. You mentioned that your approach is aligned with Facebook's. Um, and I think you've done some interesting reading, right? Background reading now that you, now that you're in this role, like how would you frame the debate as you see it? Uh, with regards to general content moderation that we're having today, and where would you say you stand, and and why? And so you, you know, it doesn't have to be Facebook specific. We could just keep it general. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to hear your view. Yeah, given given where you're working, but also given I think you spent much more time thinking about this than I have or many others on this call. Sure. Um, I'll note that I haven't uh, like off the cuff explained it. So I may, I may have some gaps and happy to like fill them in over time if folks have follow-up questions. Uh, I mostly write about this stuff, but um, basically the, the, the way that I would talk about it is um, there are some things that clearly should not be allowed on any platform. And that can be defined as like what's legal or illegal. Um, child porn is illegal, it should not be allowed. Um, I ethically am aligned with that, but even if you're not, it's a law and you have to follow that. Um, there are other things like hate speech uh, that I personally find uh, like very unsavory. I have a very strong emotional reaction against it. Um, and uh, earlier, um, so I guess my mic might be uh, going in and out. Can you I all hear me well? It's, 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 it's gotten better. I think in the beginning it was just a little, but yeah. I don't know if there's any way to fix it, but I think it's, it's probably fine now. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I could, I, I could try to go inside or something for better uh, internet if I need to. Um, but I, I, was, I was just talking about like legal versus, uh, versus not. Um, so things that are illegal, obviously shouldn't be allowed. And there's, you know, plenty of teams that work on those sorts of things. Um, when something is legal, but unsavory, that's kind of what I was getting into next. So like hate speech, for example, which uh, I viscerally am uh, like not okay with, like I have a strong negative reaction when I see um, that sort of content as an individual. Um, I, this is to my point earlier of how my, my views have changed since uh, like right leading up to joining Facebook. But uh, there's a time where I was, uh, uh, I was really unhappy with the lack of enforcement happening on Facebook in cases where certain forms of content were spreading that I personally felt were, um, again, like unsavory, uh, like, um, yeah, just like, like, like that they would hurt other people. Uh, and I uh, had an opinion that uh, there's a lot more that should be done to keep the platform uh, clean from that sort of stuff and basically censor more. Um, over time, I think uh, I've uh, thought more about the debate uh, or the trade-off between um, protecting the community from things that uh, a lot of people find harmful or don't feel safe as a result of, um, while also uh, protecting uh, free speech essentially and ensuring that uh, people have opportunities to say things in variety in as many ways as possible, um, short of like imminently hurting somebody. Uh, and I think this all comes down to like a, a exercise of drawing the line. Um, there's a question of, you know, like at what point is um, some, a, a, at what point is uh, a, cl a factual claim that someone's making misinformation versus not? Um, if somebody says that um, there is a lot of fraud happening uh, in uh, the US 2020 election um, and we have evidence, uh, let's, or, uh, there's, there's a strong belief um, among people that are close to the problem who are uh, like working in the, uh, in the uh, voting centers or wherever else, um, and that is not happening. Um, at what point do you get to call a statement that there is fraud happening, uh, like untrue, unequivocally, um, or like censor it from the platform? Um, is it okay for someone to like make a claim that, that that there is fraud happening and to start to start a debate on that? Um, I generally fall towards uh, being okay with people saying even like that sort of stuff and uh, opening up. Uh, space for uh, counter speech to uh, prove them wrong and convince the public that this person making that claim is incorrect rather than uh, making like a central uh, decision as like Facebook the entity as to like what is true or false. Um, other people might disagree and draw the line somewhere else. And I think that's where the debate uh, lies. Um, I, I could rattle off forever, but I'll, I'll stop there and see if that makes sense and if there's any follow-up questions. Yeah, we actually have one uh, from Lydia, which is, how does your team keep up with the ever-growing list of issues that you enforce slash focus on? Which is something I would be curious to hear too. List of issues you enforce and focus on. And, and, and actually there's another, you know, uh, Asad, building on Lydia's question, how does Facebook, your team, uh, expand the integrity approach to other parts of the world and all other countries that Facebook is active in? Does local precedent supersede US customs? I think this is something I've thought about a lot with regards to enforcement of laws that maybe Facebook doesn't like, uh, right? I mean, China and Hong Kong has been a, a clear one recently uh, in terms of enforcement. Um, certain uh, countries, maybe in the Middle East, that have laws that uh, Western countries might disagree with. Uh, I think that's another example that I've seen often as well. So um, yeah, what are your thoughts on both those? Yeah. Um... I think I'll, I'll start by talking about what the complexity is, and then we can get into like how we approach uh, solving for the various complexities. Um, so there are a couple of different uh, dimensions upon which harmful uh, content and behavior uh, can be broken down. Uh, you can break it down based on country um, to, uh, to, I guess it was Ryan's point, right? Um, yeah, uh, or Assad's point, um, where the norms or the definition of harm might be different in America compared to in China or Myanmar or other parts of the world. Um, so we, we want to be cognizant of that and our, our, uh, the things that we try to enforce are different depending on country. Uh, there's also uh, this product surface where, for example, uh, Facebook, uh, the product, like the, the blue product, uh, values uh, authenticity as a uh, cornerstone of the product and like your, your face, your phone number, whatever, like, it's, it's all, like you, you have an identity that is authentic on the platform. 
uh, versus on Instagram, uh, like Finstas are a popular thing. Um, people make uh, accounts for like a abstract thing. It's not like a, a human being. Um, so the product norms are different between surfaces. Um, topics can be different, uh, like between like the civic topic, the health uh, topic like coronavirus uh, or like anti-vax, for example, uh, or uh, other topics like uh, finance, religion. There's like a bunch of different ways to slice this data. Um, and then even within a given uh, problem space, so like inauthentic behavior versus uh, like hate speech versus uh, violence and the list goes on. Um, each of those things can be prioritized against each other. Uh, and even within each of those problems, like within inauthentic behavior, the one that I work in, uh, there are literally dozens of different sub uh, categories of harm uh, that uh, all like roll up to this definition of inauthentic behavior. Um, that's a lot of stuff. It can be, you know, over overwieldly to, to focus on. Um, and one of the short answers is like, we have a huge team that handles like across this myriad set of things. Um, my team focuses on inauthentic behavior. Um, and even within my team, there's several sub teams that work on different parts of the problem. And there are completely different teams that work on like hate speech or violence or whatever else. Um, focusing on like different topics like civic versus health or on countries uh, like Myanmar versus America. Uh, I think a part of the problem is like prioritizing and another problem is like defining things. Uh, defining harm, uh, it's a huge exercise in trying to understand from the perspective of the people in each country uh, or the people uh, who are engaged with each uh, topic like civic or, or uh, health. Oh, how they perceive harm. Uh, the norms might change, uh, both depending on what the individual people in the country is thinking, and also in terms of what the country uh, government thinks. Um, Descoping government for a second. Uh, one example of just like people thinking differently is uh, in America, it's not uh, common, at least like in our data, for uh, people to share devices, like, to, like share a smartphone, let's say. Um, so a lot of how we enforce against uh, like an authentic uh, representation of your identity in America is based on uh, like if somebody uh, if, if one device has several accounts that like log in and out of each other to post content, you assume it's like a person who has several fake accounts uh, versus uh, this literally happened in India. Uh, we have a false positive where we were uh, enforcing uh, against that type of behavior. But in India, it's super common for uh, like a political office, let's say, to have a, uh, a building with like 10 phones and they have like 24 or seven like shift workers that come in and log into the phone to post content. Um, and it's like a benign and uh, desired use case in, in their country. Um, so we have a lot of effort to understand these nuances and make sure that we're not uh, over-enforcing uh, or under-enforcing depending on the, the cultural context. Um, so that, that, that's a part of how we work on defining. Uh, for prioritization, it's, it's a really big problem that we're still like in the middle of trying to figure out solutions for. Uh, but uh, it really comes down to understanding the uh, severity as well as the prevalence of each type of harm that we're trying to prevent. Severity is a uh, judgment call as to if uh, harm happening in the civic space, like elections, is uh, more or less harmful to the world than uh, the same type of behavior um, happening in like the commercial space. So for example, if you're uh, like inauthentically spreading uh, content about like uh, when the election is going to be, um, we believe as a company that that is a lot more harmful than somebody trying to sell a bunch of uh, fake Ray-Bans to people. Uh, both of those things are uh, distributed in, in, in a uh, similarly harmful way from like a execution perspective, um, but the real world, world harm felt is different. Uh, and you can extrapolate this to, you know, various topics, countries across the board. Uh, once we are able to uh, account for the different weightings of severity across each of these types of problems in the overall integrity space, we're able to prioritize which of them we care the most to solve. Uh, and then we put uh, our resources, uh, engineers, designers, uh, operations folks, whoever else, uh, towards the like highest impact stuff there. Um, hopefully that helps. Happy to keep talking. <laughs> so I think we can come back to this. I think I'm going to jump into the product side. And I know I said, you know, cookie cutter product questions I, uh, I wanted to avoid. So what I was thinking is we can go over... Uh, what I'll call the hot Twitter debates that I've seen on product. And I'm not a product person, so maybe these are, uh, you know, ridiculous questions, but these are some of the debates that I've seen and I, and maybe we'll do like a little rapid fire uh, given your experience and, and what are your thoughts? Um, so I think the, the first question that I've seen in terms of debate on product is, do you have to actually be technical to be a good product manager? How, how important is it to be technical? I think you have a technical background. 
uh, but many people do not. I know a lot of people from business MBA backgrounds that all they want to do is become PMs. What, what's your advice to someone if they want to be a good product manager? Yeah. Um, I'll start by zooming out a bit and then I can talk about the technical side. Uh, what, what makes a good product manager in my view is somebody who is able to learn about whatever things they need to learn about to make good decisions and build good frameworks for other people to make decisions that helps guide the team to build the right stuff and like have impact that is good for, for the company. Uh, for you to make good decisions or for you to like build a framework that other people on your team can use to make replicatable decisions, um, you need to understand the product that you're working on. Um, some products are more technical and the decisions that you have to make to execute effectively are more technical. Like if you're working on like a, a platform within a large company that services uh, other teams within the company, um, that's a, a technical product and your users are engineers. Um, so you have to understand uh, the technical aspects to a much larger degree. Uh, versus if you work on a, let's say, consumer product at like Facebook and your job is to uh, understand why uh, people aren't sharing as much on Instagram stories as you would like them to and find ways to encourage them to do more of that. Um, sure, there's like obviously going to be like technical things that have to be done to build a new product there. Um, but a lot of that work is going to be done by the engineers. And your job in that context is to understand why people aren't sharing and what could make them share more. Uh, maybe understanding like design paradigms that uh, would better nudge or incentivize users to, to share more in, in, with this example. Um, so that, that would be a PM role where what you need to learn uh, or you know, be proficient in to do a good job is more around like user empathy, design, um, that sort of stuff. Um, this is all to say that like, good. So the, I guess the answer is it depends. It is, uh, depends on the product, is that fair to say? Yeah, this is all to say uh, it, it totally depends. Uh, you, you are a hope. A, a good PM is going to be willing and able to dig into some of the technical aspects throughout the job. Um, even if that just means like asking your engineers, like how they're building stuff and like, you know, be, be modest about like how much, you know, and kind of like figure out along the way with them. Um, but you don't need to be super technical, uh, depending on the role. So another, we'll, we'll try to do these rapid fire. Cause I got a couple, uh, second question is, um, there's another debate around uh, product managers, and I think there's two forms of the debate. One opinion I've seen is wait as long as you physically can to uh, hire a product manager, right? That um, product managers don't make sense at early stage companies. You want to wait as long as possible. Famously, there's some companies that kind of issue the, you know, get rid of the whole concept in general, right? So I think Apple is known for, for somewhere where you don't have traditional product managers. Um, and uh, uh, I think Square is another one with, with historically did not have traditional product managers. So I think my question would be, uh, do, we need, do we need as many product managers as we have? Are companies over indexing too early on product managers? Is there, uh, you know, do you think we've had this, in other, in another form of this is, everyone wants to be a product manager now, right? So has the market kind of gotten oversaturated where they're being used when they shouldn't? Or you know, is this actually a vital position that companies of all kinds are using and using in the right way? Yeah, a uh, couple of thoughts here that will hopefully connect and answer the question. Um, Let me know if it doesn't. But the first thing I'll say is that uh, I don't really care much for job titles. I think what's more important is to talk about what uh, you are functionally bringing to your company or to your team. And regardless of whether your name is, or if your title is a product manager or not, uh, there are certain functions that a PM provides to the organization that is important. Um, and these are things like uh, understanding the user really well, uh, evaluating difficult trade-offs, uh, setting goals for your team, uh, helping the team to achieve those goals through like effectively like project management. Um, th these are, to name a few, there's plenty more, but these are the types of things that uh, PMs provide to their teams. Um, it's totally possible for other people to do all, all of those things. Uh, you could uh, build a org where all the engineers are like super product driven and uh, care a lot about understanding users and maybe they don't need a PM to support them because they you know, are able to do that themselves. Um, so that, that's the first thing I'll say. Um, now, the next thing I'll say is uh, we all have limited time. And 
as we work for our companies uh, or on our own companies. Uh, we only have a finite amount of time to spend contributing to the goals that our company has. Uh, if you're an engineer, uh, most of that time uh, should probably be spent uh, building uh, like programming or like working on like the technical infrastructure design, uh, you know, for, for the product. Uh, if you're a designer, uh, like, you know, creating the like user interfaces, the pixels themselves that actually, uh, you know, constitute the experience, the experience uh, and so forth. Uh, and if you want those functions to do that stuff with the majority of their time, uh, you eventually need somebody out there to spend the hours of the day uh, filling the gap of understanding users, making trade-offs, and all those things. And that's typically where a producty person comes in. Um, in a world where you have enough engineers, where uh, some of them are producty enough to fill that gap, and there's no engineering, uh, you know, there's no gap of engineering uh, output, then you maybe don't need a PM. But I think that's harder to manage uh, in terms of like how much time the engineers spend between different tasks. Um, and then this all leads me to okay, well, like the person spending their hours doing this should be a product manager or some other function. Um, I don't think it matters too much. Uh, at a earlier company, uh, the founder typically is the person who does this sort of stuff. Um, they had the vision for the product, and they're the ones who had a lot of the hard work understanding the user needs and building a strategy off of that. Um, so founders who find that to be a good use of their time, and it's not coming at the expense of other things like fundraising, uh, building their org, uh, various other things that founders also have to do. Um, then great. But at some point, uh, even the founder runs out of hours in the day to do all the things on their plate. And someone has to, again, think about the product, these stuff that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think all of these things converge into a point in time where somebody has to spend the hours doing this. And uh, the best use of everyone else's time is to do other stuff that keeps the company on the right direction. And that's where you hire a product manager. Makes sense. Uh, on that topic, um, uh, uh, I just had my question and now it's escaping me. Um, so I had another backup. Uh, th there's, um, there, there's a big debate. Uh, oh, you know what? Sorry, here I have it. Uh, I, I, I really like the, um, the Peter Thiel question, a uh, famous interview question, uh, which maybe is uh, cliche at this point, but it's, um, you know, what's something that you believe that most people don't, but I think Applying it to products would be really interesting given your experience. So, um, we'll, we'll we'll go with that question, which is within product management, right? What's something that you believe that most other people don't? And I want to emphasize the most other people, right? So something that maybe ninety percent of PMs disagree with. Maybe we can't get there, but that's the kind of delta I'm looking for. Sure. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't have like a uh, you know like in my sleeve answer to this question. Uh, I'm sure like I would have takes that would be considered, uh, you know, uh, unconventional, uh, like given the, con I, 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 I this one, so, so. I know it's, it's all good, uh, but uh, like, like generally, I, like I, I don't really like hold in op like, opinions that like are intentionally, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, against like what majority of people think. Uh, there, there are a couple of things that um, I, think might be like not that popular uh, of an opinion across uh, not just PMs, but even like people in general uh, in like whatever roles they have. Um, this, this might end up feeling pretty, uh, you know, pretty normal to most people. But um, I think uh, one, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, specialization as uh, like a good way to get ahead in your career, like get really good at something and like exploit that, to, you know, rise through whatever path you're on. Uh, I think that uh, being uh, a generalist, I mean, I'm talking to Renko, so this is not going to be you know, that novel to, to everyone here. Um, but I think that being a generalist is uh, like its own specialization actually, um, because it helps you to like really quickly ramp up on any arbitrary thing, no matter what it is. Um, and that's a hard skill, even for people who are specialists to do. Um, and another one is, um, I found this certainly to be the case when I was earlier in my career as a product manager. And I think this probably generalizes to, to other roles too. Um, I felt uh, a strong need to uh, like, help make sure that things are going well with my team and like spend a lot of my own time like uh, building the perfect looking, uh, you know, product requirements document or like strategy or, or whatever else. Um, and I realized over time, and this, this might be unconventional, but um, I think that actually like the best people uh, in any function, whether it's product or something else, uh, actually try to work themselves out of a job and develop uh, mental models for doing things that they can just pass on to other people and that they can do it without you being involved at all. Um, so like in my job, like I, I very frequently uh, like uh, delegate and trust uh, engineers, designers, ops people, other folks on the team. 
to do a lot of the type of work that you might look at and be like, oh, like shouldn't the PM be doing that? I think they were spicy enough. I'll, I'll, I'll let that pass. Um, so uh, I have a couple more questions, but I would encourage folks, uh, you know, I know we have some content questions, but uh, maybe we'll leave the last five minutes to go back to that. But yeah, if anyone has other questions in the meantime, um, here we go from Bernard. Uh, how might we better promote a quote, being a generalist as its own specialization quote mindset here in the technology entrepreneurship industry? Hmm. I mean, to answer that question, I would need to answer the question of like, where does influence come from in general? Like not just this specific thing. And then how would you like leverage that to influence people towards considering generalism to be a specialty? Um, I think what ends up influencing the industry is probably like what the like top brand name companies are doing. Um, so an example there might be if uh, Google, Facebook, uh, you know, Stripe, other startups, um, started to uh, like more overtly define some other roles as like, we're looking for a generalist. This is like a specialty that we want to see or, or whatever. Like that would probably help to spread this across the industry. Um, I would say the same thing applies not just for companies, uh, but for like individual people. So if you're like a, a Twitter influencer or whatever to like start saying that sort of stuff as well, would it probably get the industry as a whole to think about it more? Um, the, other, the only other thing that I would say, which is like more of like a, uh, like a lagging indicator that would eventually push the former two things that I just said is just to like be a generalist and to do a really good job. Um, like be in companies as a generalist, drive a ton of impact, uh, impress people around you and make it clear that it's because you have spent a lot of time building a generalist skill set, And that would then uh, over time uh, percolate throughout the industry and make people value that more. From Andrew, another question, uh, which is actually one I was meaning to ask a two part question. Uh, what are some mental models you use often? And the second question is, how do you know everyone in tech? And I think this is something I teased in the event channel, but um, you know, you could be like, uh, you can name Barack Obama and Hadar is be like, oh yeah, I'm a good friend, Bar Barack Obama. You, you know, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm kidding here, but um, <laughs> you clearly built like a great network um, through, uh, throughout tech. And I think even outside of tech and would just love to hear, yeah. How do you know everyone in tech? The first question was mental models. I don't wanna. Uh, I'll answer the last, I'll answer the second one first and then we can sure. go back to mental models. Um, yeah, I know literally everyone, it's crazy. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, the, the people who I know come from uh, companies that I've worked at, um, the school that I went to, um, or like the obvious ones that like everyone, you know, everyone's network at least includes those things. I'd say like where my network starts to like deviate from like the kind of like the you know easy ways of like meeting people um, are maybe two things that come to mind. Uh, one of which is like a specific thing that I did in college is I planned a really large hackathon um, and uh, I like invited a bunch of different uh, people in tech to be like keynote speakers, panelists, uh, other things. Um, I got like uh, Evan Spiegel, Sam Altman, Lux Sohanian, like uh, other folks like that to uh, like come and like be a part of the hackathon. Um, and that's how I know them and like through them, other people like over time. Um, I would like abstract that out to just say, like work on something that is like interesting to other people and like give them a chance to benefit from that thing. And then they will want to engage with you. Um, and I did that at, like, by planning this hackathon, LA Hacks, but I've been doing that ever since then in a variety of ways. Like um, I'm in like this angel track community now for angel investors and it's very easy to like meet anybody by just saying like, hey, I know people that like can give you money or like, hey, I know a startup that you can give money to. Like this is mutually beneficial to everyone. It's not just me asking for, you know, help without giving anything in return. Um, so it makes it much easier for people to like respond to me. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, I am a shameless cold emailer and uh, started doing that again for this hackathon that I planned. I like literally cold emailed like every person that like is recognizable in tech at the time in like 2014. Um, but even today, like if I want to meet some random person, I'll just send them an email and the worst case is they don't respond. Um, oftentimes I get responses, um, and we chat and, um, I guess it's hard for me to tell like how much of that is like, uh, privilege from my background or like work experience or something versus like it being a, a generalizable experience that other people would have too. Um, so I might be wrong about this, but I genuinely believe that, uh, if you go, if you put yourself out there, write a like thoughtful cold email. Um, most people in at least the tech industry 
um, are going to be uh, you know open-minded and will answer it. And uh, mental models. Any a quick quick answer on anything that comes to mind? Maybe you're a Shane Parrish fan and you're reading Farnham Street every weekend, but <laughs> uh, yeah, Farnham Street's cool. Um, I don't really have like a you know like a, a, a mental model that is like this is the thing that I generally use for things. Um, if there were like a if there was like a specific uh, thing that. I, that one would apply mental model towards, I could tell what my mental model for that thing is. Um, a couple answers that come to mind maybe are, um, I try to start uh, thinking about any problem by like zooming out as much as possible and thinking about like the like abstract version of the problem and then like apply that thinking like deeper into the specific thing in mind. Um, I guess that's a mental model of some sort. Um, yeah, I don't want to waste time thinking out loud, but if there's any, uh, if there's any other specific thing, I can give a mental model for it, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I know Lydia has a question, but I think let's try to come back to it because there's one other topic we talked about, uh, which was angel investing. So I'll give a little of my opinion first, uh, and then you could react to it. Um, you're a smart guy, and I think most people here have seen the same data that I have, which is uh, investment returns in venture are heavily skewed, right? Um, probably even more skewed than public markets. Uh, deal flow matters a lot. If you're not at the top firm, it's very difficult to you know, beat, let's say the S&P 500. And for most people, as best I can tell, uh, angel investing is not a way to make great money. Um, that said, many people either do or think they, they can. And, and so, so whenever I have someone who's you know big angel investor or at least trying to get into it, I'm always curious to hear the motivations. And so from your side, do you see this as um, something where you think you're going to beat the market and, you know, it's a worthwhile investment? Is it fun? Is it kind of like Robin Hood, you know, just a different version where you're just punting, you know, some money? Is it for learning, uh, maybe helping you with different parts of your career? Like what's your, why are you actually doing it? Because you don't have to, right? Yeah, I'm past to retire. I mean, hopefully I can. No, no, I'm um, yeah, it's definitely not for money. I mean, I... Uh, the amount of money that I put into angel investing is uh, a small enough percentage of my net worth where I expect it to disappear and it won't be life changing if it disappears. Uh, my motivations for investing, uh, for angel investing, is uh, pretty much unrelated to uh, a financial upside. Um, I am sure, hopeful that I will hit a few winners, but I don't expect it to happen. Uh, the, the motivation is more so um, like I love like the startup community, and especially now that I'm at Facebook and progressively larger, like maybe I'll work for like what's a larger company like Procter & Gamble or something next to it. Um, the, the farther away I am from startups, the more I want to like stay in touch with what's going on in the startup industry. Um, and angel investing has been a great way to uh, like meet founders and like meet with them regularly and like give advice, make intros, help out. Um, so I've really enjoyed doing that. Um, I just want to give back to the community. Uh, the other big one is uh, intellectual fulfillment. Um, I am the type of mind that uh, likes to like dig into a bunch of different types of things and just kind of like learn about everything. Uh, and angel investing is a great way to uh, dig into a bunch of different types of problems that entrepreneurs are trying to solve um, at whatever level of depth I have the time and interest to, to put in. And uh, it kind of breaks me out of like the day job that I you know spend like uh, you know 40 plus hours a week uh, working on. Um, I guess the, the last thing I'll say, which is kind of more of like a, a secondary goal is uh, it's good networking as well. And uh, eventually if I want to go back into the startup world and uh, I know a bunch of founders working on different stuff like that. That would make it easier to find a company to work at. Awesome. So um, we have uh, we have a backlog of questions that I wanted to make sure we can get to. And so we'll start with the oldest one, back to content moderation. Um, so Christian had a question, which uh, uh, you were discussing uh, you know, kind of how Facebook decides to pursue different types of moderation and, and uh, enforcement of uh, the rules. And so Christian's question was, uh, don't the severity ratings that you were talking about carry some implicit value judgments? Uh, I wonder how you think about those saying apolitical. And maybe I'll add just a little flavor uh, on top, uh, given I can as a moderator. But, you know, my personal view on this is that, that uh, it seems like most political bias, I think in the media and, and potentially at big tech is not really overt political bias, but 
uh, almost what I describe as political bias by omission, right? There's only so many things you can do. There's hundreds of millions of people out there saying things. And so ultimately it's, it's a question of resourcing and um, you know, deciding that resourcing, right? And, and what, what is the biggest fire to put out tends to drive it. That's, that's my personal opinion, but I'd be curious to hear, you know, based on Christian's question and kind of my framework, like, is that wrong? Is there some political bias that's just inherent because you could only address so many uh, different types of people or would you disagree with that? Uh, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, so, so I guess there's a couple of different ways of answering the question. Um, one of which is like, no matter what you do, uh, prioritizing one thing versus another is always going to have uh, unequally distributed impact in various parts of the world. And we, every company has finite resources. So the decisions that you make are inevitably going to have some political ramification, um, whether or not it's intentional or not. Um, so yeah, like uh, if Facebook uh, has even like a implicit bias, like on average across the employee base or the leadership base um, towards like one type of problem in the world being more important than, an than, than another, uh, then the things that we put our engineering team towards solving uh, is going to affect, uh, is going to, is going to end up having a biased outcome. Um, and it's not always intentional, right? Um, so that, that's, that's part of the answer. The other one is around the severity weighting part specifically. Um, so there, whatever like humans are involved in making decisions, there's almost always going to be bias. Um, as we figure out like what things are the most like, uh, harmful on the platform to enforce against, um, I as like, a you know, like white, like you know, man living in like the Bay Area who's like, you know, on the younger side, um, definitely should not be making decisions on behalf of like the entire world and deciding like what things are the most harmful in Myanmar or like in other parts of the world. Um, and that's not just like as an individual, like my team as a whole, even though my team is like on the whole fairly diverse or faced with the company is like, you know, decently diverse compared to like other organizations. Um, still, like we're not representative of like the entire world. And the decisions that we make are going to be from our lens and it's going to be biased. Uh, so the answer is basically I try to like push off as much of that as possible into a more accountable and representative uh, decision-making entity. So for example, like I as an individual try to push off the decision-making I want to prioritize to a larger group in the company involving like more functions and doing like user research to understand what like other people in the company want uh, and, and so forth. Um, eventually pushing that off to our users and trying to understand from them like what they perceive to be harmful and having uh, like quantitative ways of uh, measuring uh, perception of harm influence what we prioritize internally. Um, the like farthest, like the farthest pushed out version of that is uh, the oversight board that folks here may have heard about already. Um, that Facebook is basically building a like independent uh, like review board that's kind of like a supreme court to make decisions about what content moderation decisions Facebook should make. Uh, and uh, that is probably like the farthest that you could push it. It's like a account a accountable uh, independent body um, that is hopefully representative uh, of the community that Facebook serves. Um, ideally, it's accountable to like people in the world too, like maybe like through a democratic uh, mechanism. I, I don't really know what the plan is there for the oversight board, but um, I think that's generally the direction that um, I, at least from my like individual point of view, see things headed. And I think that's the the right approach. Awesome. Uh, so, have some other questions. Uh, first from Lydia. Um, any uncommon tips on writing a successful cold email? Uh, so yeah, anything anything unusual that you do beyond uh, maybe what what Jen likes to teach us in some of our uh, some of our onboarding and events? Uh, yeah, the, the rank of material is pretty good. Um, I, I'll, I'll just like say from scratch, like what I would do, I, I would I would keep it as concise as possible. Um, I would uh, make it personalized to what I know about the person. Um, I would try to get some uh, like social signaling if possible, like someone introing me in or whatever, like, and that gets easier as your network grows and grows. Uh, and the last thing I would say is like, have something that's in it for them. Um, for a lot of people, like it's, it's like they're happy enough, like mentoring or helping other people. Um, but for some people, uh, they'll be even more likely to respond if they can make an investment or be invested in or have a speaking opportunity. Like there's plenty of different ways to add value to other people. And the more you can do that, the more uh, responses you'll get. One, one more uh, from Dan. Uh, so the role you have now was Facebook explicitly looking for a generalist. 
Seems like it would be uh, a given with the topic of trust and integrity, not purely a technical problem with clear KPIs. Did Facebook already have a generalist in mind? Uh, Facebook doesn't have, to my knowledge, like a like, like a meta generalist role where like you can do whatever you want. Um, but the like product manager hiring uh, loop, for example, is a generalist PM. Um, you're evaluated on like uh, kind of lowest common denominator things that all PMs have to be good at. And then you do team matching based on your like specialties or whatever you're interested in. Uh, and I would expect it to be the same for like engineering, uh, data science and other roles. Awesome. Uh, I think that's about it. We're at time. I know you said you could go over. So uh, maybe we'll stay for about five, 10 minutes and see if anyone else wants to go over. But uh, feel free to hop off. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I think uh, let's keep it going. Anyone who else has questions, otherwise I'll uh, ask a couple more questions that I have for you. Um, so one, one thing that's really you know, struck me by, by your website and, and just talking to you many times um, is, you know, and, and on your website, I'll quote you, right? You say, uh, when you think about your career, uh, it's ultimately all about quote, social impact. And maybe I'll press you a little bit here because um, I think, you know, we've all thought about this, right? Is like, how do we align our, our kind of goals and our morals and everything together? And, you know, in some ways you take a, let's say contrarian view to, you know, maybe your average person in tech in the sense that you care very much about social impact, maybe more than anyone else uh, th that I've seen. But, but you've worked for people, you know, companies that historically maybe are vilified, right? So like I worked at Uber, I know what it's like. Uh, you worked at Lyft and Postmates. Facebook today is definitely not the place that uh, I think a lot of people think about when they think about social impact. I personally do, but I think I'm a minority. So I'd love to hear, yeah, like, you know, in some ways, did, did, do you still think the companies that you worked for are, you know, ha had the social impact? Because I know obviously with Lyft, you, you know, came out against Prop 22 and you have some concerns there. Do you feel like most people just get it wrong that these companies are actually real drivers of social impact? Um, I know on Facebook also, you mentioned that the exact thing that you're working on is most important and it really is less about the company. So just love to hear about how you think about social impact and how you chose the companies that you did, uh, which maybe to, you know, your average person wouldn't strike you as the first ones you'd go to. Yeah, uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, the thing that I try to optimize for is the impact that I can have on the world through my job, not the impact that the company has. So for example, I don't necessarily think that Facebook is like uh, the most socially impactful company like of all the companies that I could work at. I think they're, like, there's a lot of things that they're doing that's, that is good and we could talk about that. Um, but like I didn't optimize for Facebook, the most socially impactful company. I optimized for, in this case, like mitigating the harm that Facebook does to the world uh, through uh, the integrity work. Um, or another example might be um, when I, uh, towards the end of my time at Lyft, uh, when I wasn't really convinced anymore that uh, Lyft's model or like the gig economy's model was like socially impactful for uh, like for the working class, uh, then I felt that my role uh, at Lyft uh, that could be impactful was trying to like change how people thought about the problem, uh, influence uh, policies uh, on the product side uh, that would be uh, better or at least less bad uh, for the driver. Um, so I think like this is all to say uh, you can have individually positive impact even in an organization that you don't think is uh, like doing the most like socially impactful stuff. Um, besides that, I'll say um, my, my career is still like, you know, in its very early stages. There's like many, many decades left where I will, you know, where I intend to be working and having impact. And I think that uh, learning uh, compounds uh, such that like the latter years are the most important ones for the overall impact that you have. And uh, what I'm optimizing for right now is uh, like learning as much as I can and kind of just growing my capacity to have impact in whatever direction I want to have. Um, and just working at some of these companies has helped uh, in like abstract ways, like making me a better product manager, better thinker, whatever. Uh, but even just like evaluating if certain problems are worth solving uh, in the way that a company is trying to solve them or not. Um, like when I joined Postmates and Lyft, I was exploring if uh, the trade-offs of uh, like gig work and like uh, contract work in particular uh, is like a net positive or not. Um, and I didn't have like a, a strong opinion in either direction on it early on. And over time I developed that opinion uh, through working there. Um, I think over time as I get farther into my career, maybe I'll 
um, have a different way of approaching what companies I go to work for. But for now, it's more like, um, where can I learn the most and also have individual impact? And I think on the topic, you know, you've talked about on your website, other careers you could have had, uh, you've written out, you know, pretty extensively. And so, you know, let, let's say tomorrow, uh, you couldn't work in tech anymore. Let's, let's not get into the details, but you can't work into, in tech anymore. You need to find a new career. Uh, what do you think you'd be doing? Uh, you, you could even phrase this as if you didn't work in tech starting 10 years ago, you know, what would you have chosen? But, um, you know, I, I think you seem to have some other career paths that you think would have been pretty reasonable based on your interests. Yeah. Um, the like selfish fun answer would be music, um, like making music or like facilitating other artists making music. Um, but uh, I think more like tied to kind of like what I want to achieve through my career, um, like for like for the world, I would say um, either working in policy, uh, like developing new like laws basically um, and yeah, be contributing to that either like as a lawmaker or as like a researcher that influences the policy. Uh, another option would be, uh, I've always finished in behavioral economics. I like almost uh, early in college wanted to get a PhD in it. Um, now that's like way too uh, out there compared to what I've been uh, working towards. Um, but uh, that would, st I would still find that interesting. And I think that uh, there are a lot of ways in which like academics are able to influence public discourse um, through providing like research findings that change the public opinion or consulting for companies to make them more uh, impactful. Uh, Jen just uh, commented, relates to my last tweet. I had a tweet. Thank you for, thank you for following my Twitter, Jen. It's, you've been one of my supporters for a long time, uh, <laughs> which was, you know, in, in, in the 2000s, every MBA wanted to become, you know, investment banker, work in finance. In the 2010s, all the MBAs wanted to become product managers. And in the 2020s, you know, what are people going to want to do? And I don't have a great answer. Uh, but I think there, there is this like general question, right. Of like the societal trend for like being a PM in 2010 is pretty different than being a PM in 2020 and how, how the role and how kind of, uh, what's, what's in vogue is, has, has changed. I don't know. You know, you don't have to answer that question. I, I think, I think it's just a generally interesting question around. And, and again, right. Like we only have whatever 10, 12 people, like feel free to chime in, uh, now it's like the after party. So. But, um, but I think that's like, uh, that's an interesting framework right around kind of the trends in tech and um, how jobs are gonna change and how sectors are gonna change. So um, really? uh, I, you know, happy to end it there, but also um, if anyone else has anything to chime in with, four is yours before, before we wrap up. I can also just quickly answer that, that lesson that you said um just just for fun um yeah. i actually think that pm will probably still be a pretty popular role um sure it's changing in some ways but on, on the whole it's still a role that is uh i think like at least perceived to be like strategic and uh like kind of influencing the direction of tech companies which are still like a big part of the like for-profit sector um but I, I do think that one trend that i'm interested in seeing uh like how it influences uh what people choose to work on is the uh like expenditures required to start a company are decreasing over time uh, with stuff like Stripe, Shopify, the list is only increasing over time. Um, you can have a bunch of like solo entrepreneurs starting their own companies. And um, while this has always been a hot thing since like the start of the tech industry, I would expect more people to maybe try to start their own companies because it's so much cheaper to do so. Uh, one, one, one more question also from Bernard. Uh, since you're a master cold emailer, are you also fairly receptive to coldish emails, at least more so than other people? Uh, and mentions give and take from Adam Grant. Uh, yeah, I mean, I try to answer every email that I get. Um, if are you I ever... be sending a cold email, Bernard, to to <laughs> Hadar? Is that is that what this is for? It would be warm. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's a war. That's a warm email now. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a warm email. Uh, I think one last question on my side, because uh, you know, I always here for some spicy takes. Um, so what's, what's one, you could take this in any way, but uh, you could say company, sector, industry, anything in tech, right? Um, what do you think is very overrated today? It could be a company is way too overvalued. It could be people care way too much about certain things. 
And what do you think is underrated, right? And I'm, I'm leaving this intentionally open. I think companies is always interesting, but not everyone has strong views on, on companies, but I think it would give us an interesting lens into like how you're thinking about the world, right? And like where you see the world going and kind of what's underrated right now and what's, what's gonna be, you know, uh, going out in the next couple of years. Mm. You can tell we didn't prep this because <laughs> these are really out there questions that I eat. <laughs> oh, these, are, these are fun. Um, I think that uh, technologies like machine learning and AI, uh, blockchain, let's even just scope that because that, that's so like nascent, but like machine learning and AI in particular, let's say, uh, I think are super overrated. Um, I think that people think it's like going to solve all the world's problems as like this like abstract technology, but in reality, like experiences are what changes people's lives. And an experience can come from machine learning or from any other thing. Um, so I would, I would hope to see people focus less on like the, on a specific underlying technology and more on a like experience that they could create in the world, regardless of how it's made. Um, what I think is underrated is uh, like heavy operational expenses to building businesses, and by that I mean like uh, heavy like ops, heavy like regulatory. Uh, uh, factors, um, sales, marketing, even. Um, I think that we're heading towards a world where there's like a lot of big players uh, that have been around for at this point a couple of decades um, that have like way too large of a scope and are doing a great job at satisfying needs across all of them. So I expect that we're going to see a ton of startups that are working on like a pretty verticalized and like operationally intensive uh, solution for any arbitrary problem. And they'll be doing it a lot better than anyone else's. Good answer. Um, I I have more, but I think uh, you know we're we're running up and now Jen's got to go, so uh, I think we'll end it there. But I think we could probably go on for for longer for them too. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, thanks Hadar and uh, yeah. If you have any questions, I think uh, Hadar your your website we link to so they could reach out there. Um, feel free to ping me if you're in Renko. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks so much, guys. This was thanks lovely. All, all right. Yeah. Bye.